Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Doing okay? Excellent. It is good to be here together. Uh, it is good to be worshiping together. It's good to gather on this Sunday morning to worship God uh, here in the sanctuary and all of you online. It is good to be together. Uh, just a couple of things before I turn it over to Alette for our call to worship this morning. If you are online and have any troubles, feel free to uh, text 403-560-2688, and we will do what we can to help you out there. Uh, as well, just a, I don't know if warning is the right word. That's probably too strong of a word, but the order of worship this morning is going to be a little different than we tend to do. Um, we're going to, music and communion will all be at the beginning, and then uh, we're going to have our question and answer time uh, at the end. So that's kind of how the flow of the service is going to go this morning. And with that, I have, I'm going to turn it over to Alette for the call to worship as we sing together. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. <laughs> um, so this morning's song we're doing, um, it's called Desert Song. And it might be a new song to you. It's, um, it's about when we go through things in life that get us down. Um, how we are still able to praise the Lord through the hardships, um, through the things that we are going. And so I'm going to read to you Romans 8, uh, verse 37 to 39. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you are um, if you are going through a hard time, just remember who God is, and yeah, we can praise Him. We can praise Him in our hardships. So won't you stand and sing with us this morning? Sing praise to the Lord. This is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer in my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain there is a faith proved of more worth than gold. So refine me, Lord, through the flame. And I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare. God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the battle When triumph is still on its way I am a conqueror and co-heir with Christ So firm on his promise I'll stand And I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice, I will declare God is my victory, and he is here. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. Formed again. 
is my victory and he is near. This is my prayer in the harvest when favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again. The seed I've received I will sow. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven, nor on earth, or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Um, and the elders, they sang a song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. And from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that deserves a praise, yes. <laughs> God, with all creation we sing praise to the King of Kings. You are our everything, and I will adore you.
around this table this morning. Uh, we gather as God's people as one body. This is not a table exclusive to Crescent Heights. It's not a table exclusive to any particular gathering of people other than those who are in Christ. This is a gathering to remember, to celebrate, to reflect upon all that Jesus has done in and through his death and resurrection. And so as you gather this morning, I would encourage you to take time to reflect on who Christ is, the gift that he has given you and I to gather together as his body, united in one spirit, to be one body with him as head. We don't take this table lightly, and it, at the same time, this is not a legalistic ritual we partake in. It is a solemn, but also a life-filled gathering and sharing that we are doing together here. We are his body, and we share and remember him. As we've read numerous times, not only here in this church, but throughout the ages, as Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, reminding them why they gather around the table. He says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Though the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This is a table of remembrance and a table of anticipation. A remembrance of what Christ has done and an anticipation of what he is going to complete when he returns again one day. And so as his gathered people, we partake together in the one body, the one blood, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I'd invite you, for those of us who are here, to open your uh, communion cups. For those of you at home, however and whatever you have prepared, you can get that ready now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to begin and lead us in a prayer, and I'm going to create space for you to come before Christ on your own in prayer, and then I'll invite us to partake of the, the bread and the juice together at the end. And so let's turn to him in prayer. Father God, you love your creation with a sacrificial love where you would send your son, that you would enter into humanity, into creation, to not only point us back to you, but to lay down your life, that our sins may be forgiven. But you are a powerful God, powerful God, filled with life. You are life itself, and through you, Christ was resurrected. Death was defeated, sin was no more, and you've invited us to follow. Jesus, you've shown us the way, and you've invited us to put our entire life in you to allow your spirit to work in and through us, to convict us of our sin, to remind us of your presence, to point us and lead us in the direction you would have us go. And so as we come before you now individually, hear our prayer, our confession, our repentance, and our praise for you. We thank you, Lord, that you see us, that you hear us, that you laid down your life for us. Amen. Let's together partake in the body and blood of Christ.
Thank you, Jesus, for your ongoing work through the power of the Spirit, uniting us together, reminding us that we are your creation, your redemption, and that we will have life in the full because of your love for us. Amen. Let's respond together in song. You can be seated, sorry. <laughs> oh. All right, as we grab uh, seats, uh, as Tim grabs his seat, uh, we are, so for those who are new or haven't been around for the last little while, what we've been doing on the first Sunday of the month, and this is going to uh, change come September, we're going to move this uh, format to the end of the month. Uh, but what we've been doing is inviting a question and answer period. And so it's an opportunity for us as a congregation to interact with one another uh, over the, the passages that have been preached on or anything else that's kind of um, come up in life. And it's a, so we've got some 
prepared questions that we'll, we'll talk about, but it's, we want you to interact. And so if you have a question, uh, by all means, raise your hand. Noelle has got a wireless mic and she will run around. Uh, she will walk carefully so she doesn't trip and fall again. Um, uh, she'll, she'll come to you to ask the question that you may have. And for those of you online, if you have a question, you can either text uh, 403-560-2688 or write it directly into the chat and uh, we will get those questions there. And so there's people monitoring Facebook uh, here uh, that we can answer those. And so again, this is an opportunity. We really, as the people of God, are called to live in the living word. And so this is an opportunity to do that, um, to just share together in a little bit different format uh, to explore God's word together. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Tim, who's going to lead us this week and uh, apparently try to, he's got some difficult questions for me uh, that I am currently unaware of. So we'll see how that goes. Our time may end up very short um, if there's something I can't answer. Well, um, after speaking to some of the, uh, the younger folks in the congregation, okay, I think, let's see here. I will just, oh, there we go. I think I can hear me now. Is that better? Awesome. After speaking to some of the younger folks in the congregation, which I love to do, because the, the kids come up with some fabulous questions, I do have a couple that aren't, weren't emailed in. They were whisper mailed in. So, so these are Goodwin child questions is what I'm hearing. Potentially. <laughs> First one, if you were given an opportunity to move into a tree house and live there, would you take that? Do I have to live with other people in said tree house? <laughs> nope, I, I'm it, getting a big shake of the head. If nope. it's at least five or 600 square feet or bigger, which is a really big tree house, uh, I would love that. I would Actually, I've thought of for a number of years, um, uh, Kingsfold has a tree house that you can go rent. The only difficulty with it is it has only a heater and you can't take food into it. So it's a fasting tree house. So I haven't fasted in a tree house and I haven't been willing to take that uh, venture yet. But I would, if I could, if I could holiday in a tree house, that would be, that'd be pretty fun. I don't know about living there all the time. Yeah. So day camp next year will be in a tree house. In then? a tree house, sure. Okay. Uh, the other question I had was when you were the age of some of our younger congregants, um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, man. So if you go really young, uh, I remember my parents had this book. Uh, it was kind of a follow your kid through the ages sort of thing. And, and like Ange and I, my mom and dad were not great at, at keeping track of these kinds of things. Uh, Ange and I had all sorts of ambitions of keeping track of our kids. And we, we didn't do, I mean, we kept track of them. We still know where they are and those kind of things. But, um, I, but I do remember in this book writing down at one point when I was in early elementary, I want to be a cowboy or an astronaut, uh, which are very different things. Um, I think I want to be a fireman at one point. And, and as I look back, uh, these are all very strange occupations for me because they're a lot of hard work. Um, and I can't imagine myself being a cowboy or an astronaut or a fireman because that's way too much work. That is, that is an intensity that I am not familiar with uh, in physical labor. But that, those are the kind of things as a young kid. And then once I hit junior high onward, I had no idea. Absolutely no idea. At one point, I thought of being a chiropractor because being a doctor was good, but a, no, a non-messy doctor seemed really good. Like you just deal with the outside of the body um, in terms of touching. Um, and then, but I never did that. And it wasn't until, honestly, until I was late 20s, early 30s, where I finally recognized what God was calling me to do uh, as a pastor. So it took me a long time to figure out what I really wanted to do. So I went from, you know, cowboy, astronaut to pastor. Seems like a natural arc. Yeah. So, so as a youngster, you, were, you said those sounded like way too much work. No, as a young kid, not knowing how much work they are, they sounded yeah. great. And then okay. looking back, I'm like, man, those guys have a really hard job. Okay. Yeah. So, so then you wound up doing this, and this is so much less burden. Nice segue, by the way. It's a... <laughs> I mean, it's a, yeah, it's not as physically hard. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to jump in then because um, as, as we've been hearing, uh, leadership in a church is not 
necessarily an easy task. Paul wrote to Timothy and uh, all kinds of rules and, and everything. Why, why was it so important for Paul to impart this information? Was, was he trying to establish structure for the church or, or was there something else to it? Okay, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as we've been going through 1 Timothy, that's what we've been basing everything on. We've covered four chapters so far. There is a lot of uh, um, literally what you would call or grammarly, grammatically what you would call imperatives. Paul telling Timothy, do this, do this, do this, do this. And it can feel like a list of rules. Here's, you, if you do all these things, then you're doing leadership correctly. Um, which is true. If you, if you listen to what Paul had to say and you followed through on those and executed those the way he was intending for them to be executed, uh, things would go well. And they're dealing with heresy in the church, people who are not, and he uses phrase lightly, they're not following the rules, but it's not about the rules. And so it's not about setting up church structure. And so um, churches throughout the ages, I mean, for all of us who are here in a Baptist church or congregationally led church, um, our structure is much different than, say, an Anglican church or a Catholic church or a Lutheran church or, I mean, the list goes on, but they would all say that First Timothy is the Word of God. And so how did all these different structures come out of, governance formats come out of, um, a gr groups of different people reading the same text? And so we have to look beyond the, the point, the imperative points that Paul is telling to see, is there something else going on there? And really there was. Um, that's what, what ended up or landed Jesus on the cross, is there was something more than just a new teacher coming to town going on. Uh, God had come in the flesh, who was claiming to be king, which the Romans didn't like, um, and claiming to be the Messiah, which the Jews didn't like. And so the question that we all have to wrestle with, just as they did, was, is Jesus the Son of God? Is he uh, the Messiah? And if that's true, then we have to see what's written in Timothy and every other scriptural passage through that light. And so what Paul is here now saying to Timothy was, these are the rules, not, he wasn't saying these are the rules, follow them, things will go well. He was saying, Jesus is establishing an entirely new kingdom. He's inaugurated the kingdom. And so if you read the gospels, you hear Jesus say a lot of the kingdom is here, but not yet. The kingdom is amongst you, but not yet. Um, and so what Paul is saying is, we are called to um, live out this new kingdom way of being, which includes love for our enemies, which includes generosity in ways that make no sense to people who don't understand who Jesus was, uh, which includes discipline in ways for the purpose of restoration, as opposed to discipline for the purpose of being punitive or, or you know, landing someone in jail. The whole, everything that Jesus was about was about restoring humanity to its created perfection. Uh, which was only possible through Jesus' death and resurrection. And so what Timothy is doing here is he's, or Paul is doing, he's saying to Timothy and to the Ephesian church, these are the ways of Jesus. Adhere to them in order to practice a new way of being humanity, a new way of being God's creation. And it, it doesn't reflect any other kingdom. It doesn't reflect uh, the Romans. It doesn't reflect the Jewish um, way of life uh, in terms of how they were living it out at that time. Uh, it, it completes the law, though, as, as uh, Jesus said. And so what he was doing wasn't a list of rules, is the short answer. It was establishing the kingdom. This is what it means to be kingdom people. Um, and you need good leadership in that. You need conformity to the ways of Jesus in that. You need discipline in that, because as we know, we're all going to go astray, and we need to be brought back in, restored. Um, and so there's a much bigger picture going on here um, than just follow these rules and everything will go well, or follow this certain structure and the church will be what it should be. Which is a bit of a convoluted answer. I don't know if I got that all nailed down. I'm sure we'll hear about it on email. Yeah, so if you have, yeah, if you, <laughs> if you have any questions, by all means, respond uh, now or online. For those of you online, if there's things that need to be, you want me to try to clarify. Um, another, another question that came out, Paul mentions to Timothy, um, the phrase, not a lover of money. Mm. And we've seen all kinds of, of, of examples of some of the, um, the high-profile ministers and that with you know, big bank accounts and they've got their, their private planes and that. 
where where is that line? Is there a line in the sand? Yeah, so that's in the, I think that's 1 Timothy 3, where Paul is talking about, here's the leaders. This is what an overseer and a deacon should be like, and they shouldn't be lovers of money. And, and yeah, we see a lot of leaders, we see a lot of pastors um, with big bank accounts and private planes and all that kind of stuff. And, and again, this isn't about a volume. This isn't a, a matter of being rich or poor. Uh, this is a matter of being, where is your heart at? And we deceive ourselves often about where our heart is at. So it's really easy for me, you know, as a middle class, Calgarian, average kind of pastor person, uh, to look at someone with a big plane and say, come on, really? Do you really need a big plane? Um, and, and maybe there's some validity to what I'm thinking and, you know, what I'm evaluating about a person in that. But, the, but it, as it always comes down to is where is our heart at? So whether you've got, you know, a $100,000 house, well, if you can find a $100,000 house in Calgary, that's a whole different ballgame. But, you know, whether you, whether you make 50000 a year or 100000 a year or $10 million a year, that's not the issue. That's not the issue that Paul's talking about. Like, don't put rich people in leadership. That's not what he's saying. He's saying put people whose love is not in money, whose love uh, is in Jesus. And so being wealthy or not is completely irrelevant. The question is, how is the person in love with Jesus or not? And we can see people who are below the poverty line, and we can see people who are the richest in the world whose love of money is the same. And so volume isn't the issue. Where your heart is at is the issue. And so when you look at, I mean, if you take it out of that realm, you take it into love your neighbor as yourself. You know, how many of us genuinely within our hearts, love our neighbor? And how many of us are like, oh, I can put up with the, my neighbor a little bit and I can smile and say hi day to day, but I wouldn't actually sacrifice something for them. I wouldn't actually give of myself for them. And again, we, we deceive ourselves, so we'll create all sorts of excuses. I don't have time or, um, you know, they, were, they don't deserve it or whatever the case may be. Um, the question, that whole list that Paul is talking about, is, it comes down to our heart. Where is your heart really at? And if someone's pursuing money as a means of salvation, if money's become an idol, that is the last person you want in, well, not the last, but you don't want that person in leadership because the decisions made about church and ministry and gospel and all that kind of stuff is going to be, is going to sit on um, financial salvation. Um, that doesn't mean that finances shouldn't, finances should very much be a part of our discussion as a church um, and, and how we're operating because that's how we make things happen in terms of um, buying and selling and that kind of stuff. But if we're making decisions based on the love of money, on it being our salvation, not trusting in Jesus, uh, then th that's not how the church should be, operate. And so again, that, as we said a couple weeks ago, that's for leaders, but that's for anyone. So if you're not in, currently in leadership, don't be a lover of money either. That's the call of, of Christ, is to empty our set, to have him only as God, nothing else. Money, food, exercise, sports teams, whatever. Relationships, interpersonal relationships, don't make those your God. People will fail you. Uh, the people I am closest to have failed me as I have failed them. Um, they, we are not one another's salvation. Jesus is our salvation. Okay. Is there any responses on the internet or in here? It's on? Okay. Well, Another question in chapter 3. It says the leaders or bishops were not to be given wine, while the deacons were not to be given much wine. Is there a distinction, and should we pay attention to this? I would, I would answer, the simple answer is don't be a lover of money. It's the same issue. What's driving how you're behaving and what you're doing? And so if we get into, I think if we start slicing, the, for, as best as I understand, and I could be slightly off on this, but as best as I understand, the culture of Paul's day and, and definitely in the Hebrew culture, um, the scalpel that you and I tend to cut things apart with to get at the very, like, what's the, the basic smallest unit um, was not as big a concern for them. And so there is, I would say, the short answer is there's no difference. The bigger picture is don't let wine or alcohol or whatever drive your life. It shouldn't be central to your decision making. 
It shouldn't be the, you know, I can't have a meal without wine. That would be terrible. No, you can have a meal if it's bread and water. People of you know, Christians had to go through that um, throughout the ages. And so what is it that you're living on is the bigger issue. And so leaders shouldn't be driven by alcohol one way or the other. The much wine, um, maybe Paul just felt like throwing in an extra word uh, in there, but there is no difference. Okay, so with, with some of the rules, and there, there's another one that comes out in, in the scripture. I'm wondering how it applies. Can a single man be an elder? Because it, it mentions husband to one wife. Right. How, do, how does that work? So as I, as I read on that, um, that's a good question. And as I read, the, the people who are much smarter than me, uh, which are the guys that you know, study through the scriptures, they know the culture, they know the language, they've cross-referenced everything, um, there seemed to be a general consensus that it wasn't about being married or not. And really, if you read through um, the New Testament, especially as a whole, marriage isn't as big a deal as we have, especially in the last probably 100 years, it isn't as big a deal as we have made it out to be. And that's with a big asterisk. Um, and I want to clarify that. Marriage is a big deal if you're married. Stay married, remain faithful, all those kind of things. But we don't find completion in marriage. And so being single is a perfectly valid way to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, it, and it's on equal par in terms of marriage. And so you hear Paul saying that to the church in Corinth. If your passions burn for someone else, get married and remain faithful and live that out. But if you want to remain single, if you, that's, he says, Paul says, it's a better way to go to be single because then you don't have to worry about um, taking care of family and worrying about all those sorts of things. You can just focus strictly on the word of, you know, what God is calling you to do. And so we, I, I don't, I'm not a sociologist, so I couldn't say one way or the other, but, but we tend to and have glorified marriage as being something superior to being single. And the New Testament says, um, seemingly throughout, that, that that's a false dichotomy. And so when it comes to leadership within the church, if you're going to be a leader who's married, you better be a representative of Genesis 2 kind of marriage. A man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife to form one. Uh, or it doesn't even say wife in, the, in Genesis, but be united with the woman to, to create one. Um, but if you're single you're perfectly capable of leading if that's what God is calling you to do. And so it's not an issue of being married or not, but it is an issue if you are married, how do you interact? How do you live out um, that married life? Is it representative of Jesus and the church? Or is it representative of the culture that you live in? Or is it a power struggle? Then again, you're moving away from what it means to be a leader within the church. Okay, that actually um, comes around to another question that came in. Um, Paul mentions church leaders being above reproach. Mm. Now, if, if being married or being single is, you know, there isn't anything definite there, um, how does above reproach work? Is there a passing grade? How does it come into play for us? Mm. That's, yeah. The passing grade for being above reproach is living out and recognizing that we are sinners saved by grace. That attitude, that heart position, says that I'm neither perfect nor uh, the devil. It says that I, on my own, am incapable of living as God desires me to live because I'm constantly distracted by sin. And that recognition says I need Jesus, and I need to follow him, and I need to conform to his ways. But that also, in that, as I, let's use just the example, as I love my neighbor... There is this battle that happens within me, and I'm, I'm hoping it happens within you, and I'm, I'm pretty sure willing to bet that it happens in you, that there are times where I genuinely love my neighbor, and there are times when I falsely love my neighbor. And so the above reproach piece is, are you someone who consistently has a heart for the ways of Jesus? That if you, I, I think I joked a little bit about it uh, in the sermon about if, the, if you sliced through, if we were all pieces of cake, or an entire cake, and I sliced through the cake, would I find cake all the way through? Or would I find some styrofoam and, and just something to prop up the outside to make it look like a cake? And so above reproach is, over the course of this person's life, or knowing this person, 
um, that they demonstrate a consistent heart for who God is and what it means to engage in his ministry. Um, that's the kind of people that should be in leadership, that if you, again, if you dissected them, you would find exactly what you expected. If you search their internet uh, profile or, you know, what they search on the internet or what they do behind closed doors, you know, I think we all probably have some hidden skeletons, but you would be like, oh, okay, move on, as opposed to kind of cracking open a door and realizing that, oh my goodness, there's a whole lot of stuff about this person that we don't know. And so we do the best we can um, as, a, as churches to, to um, put in positions of leadership, people who are like that, but we do know that, again, we're not, we don't have the magic ball. We don't have the insight that God does to know really what's going on in people's hearts, but, but we, we try to you try to select those whose lives seem consistently thirsting after who God is. And again, that's not just for leaders. That's all of it. We should all be thirsting after God constantly, constantly changing and growing in the ways of Christ. Um, but when we select leaders, let's pick those, what Paul is telling Timothy, pick those who, whose life seems consistent with what, what they say and what they do and who they are behind closed doors and the story you hear on the street. Like if they're a business person, that that everyone that they do business with just says, this person, I love doing business with them because I always know I'm going to get a fair measure. I'm always going to get a fair deal. I'm always going to, I can trust this business person. Um, if you're a doctor, that you're, you know, that you're consistently, that people say, I love this doctor. The, the doctor can see me and hear me. And, and when they don't know what's going on, they, they'll do what it takes to find the answers to things. Um, if you're a cleaning, you know, someone who does cleaning or, garbage pickup, or I mean, any kind of task that, that when people watch them, they are just consistently demonstrating care, concern, love, the ways of Jesus in the things that they do. Uh, that's, an, that's a person who's above reproach, that the community and the church have the same experience with them. Okay. How are we doing for nothing online? Okay. I've got some questions about chapter four as well. All right. But first, I have one more youth-related. Uh-oh. Hope everybody's okay with this. We're in the middle of the Olympics right now. Hmm. I was asked what your favorite event is. Yes, that is my favorite event. I love, well, I, again, I, I referenced a few weeks ago about the skateboarding. Um, and Andrew, as we were driving home, Andrew's like, you left me wondering whether you don't like skateboarding or you don't like that it's in the Olympics or you just didn't like what they did in skateboarding. Um, the answer is I didn't like what they did in skateboarding. It seemed kind of, I mean, it was, I, could, I would die doing what they were doing, but, um, but I just love competitive sport. I think it's, I think competitive sport, pure competitive sport, I know there's all sorts of politics and, you know, they do drug testing. I love competition for the sake of getting better. So, like, this morning I got up, we watched the, three of us watched the 100-meter final in men's. Uh, this morning, DeGrasse, the Canadian runner, came in third. And I commented to, her, to Nathan and Tracy, who were watching with me, I just love that he's smiling the whole time. He came in third, he set a personal record, and he went around and hugged the rest of the crew and, like, the guys he was running against. I love, or, I don't know if it was this morning, later on, or last night, there was two Swiss teams playing beach volleyball. And they're, like, when you get on the court, they're, they're competing against one another, pushing one another, angry at one another when stuff doesn't go their way. But at, off the court, they're teammates and they support one another and encourage. The same with the swimmers. So I just love competitive sport done well when people are in it for the right reasons. I hate, I can't stand competitive sport when it's a me versus you at a personal level. I love, I love getting beat by someone who's better than me in a sport. Um, just as much as I love beating someone in a sport. It's, it's just... I love it. So sprinting, I love because it's fast and powerful. Um, the, the ball games, volleyball, basketball, I love those because I love team sports. I, and I'm just amazed. I was saying to Art and Donna earlier, I think someone told me this, this isn't my idea, but someone told me this years ago that you should put an average good athlete in the Olympics um, just to really see how incredible these athletes are. Um, and it, yeah, it, it is amazing. At the same time, it's a little bit crazy. Like they're all, I think, elite athletes are all a little bit psycho uh, because you have to be to be that, that good at anything. And, and I don't have that in anything. I would love to be able to like clean my floor as good as they can run 100 meters. Like anything to do it that well would be amazing. Uh, but I don't have the tenacity to go after that. 
I'll talk to Ange and your kids about putting you <laughs> in not, a training program. No, I'm not Tracy. Program. I'm not training. I... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to jump into to chapter four. Sure. Um, Paul uses the phrase later times, mm. and I've been asked this before. We had someone else in the congregation ask, what is he referring to, and when when do we anticipate those times? Are they are they behind us now? Are they still to come? Or what? Well, I would say, so he, he references that in later times, people are going to fall away. People are going to be sinful. People are going to treat their neighbors like garbage. They're going to, in later times. I would argue that if you look from the first century till now, that's happening. Post-resurrection, I mean, the church exploded, right? We see in the beginning of Acts, this incredible growth in the church. Thousands of people daily showing up. Like, with the... Like, how many in here, forget COVID, let's forget about that for a second. If a thousand people showed up gathering for worship next Sunday, I mean, I think I would probably be out of a job because I'm on holidays, and so maybe that would indicate, you know, what's going on. But, but if a thousand people, if 50 people that we didn't know showed up because they encountered Jesus and wanted to go worship, how would you respond, right? Like, it would freak me. I'd be excited and scared all at the same time. And so, so the church exploded, they had thousands of people showing up, like things were just going crazy. And, and then they realized as they started to form into these groups that we now call churches, they called them, they called them like ecclesia, right? This gathering, it was a, a civil um, organizational kind of name. As they actually gathered and put some structure to what it was they were doing, um, all of a sudden these things started to happen. So you get the letter to the Corinthians, or letters to the Corinthians. You get this letter from Paul to Timothy about the church in Ephesus. You get the issues that were going on in Galatia. I mean, on and on and on. And so Paul's, it, at the one hand, he's saying in later times, but at the same time he's saying right now you can see it happening before you, that people are trying to lead one another astray. We're, for, you know, we're one generation in and we're already forgetting what it means to be the body of Christ. And so that has been ongoing ever since. And so, um, again, as I read other people, um, they suggested that it was kind of, that was the times. Paul was kind of referring to the later times being right now. Because they, many of them, and Paul included, expected that Jesus was coming back that day. Like, or like in their lifetime. They thought that he was going to return and the kingdom would be fully established and all this stuff wouldn't. And as they got older, Paul's older in his, in his ministry experience now and he's writing to this younger guy who's he's been training and equipping. Um, they realize like, maybe he's not going to come back right away. And, and it's easy for us, we're sitting two millennia out, to say, well, he could come at any day. Um, but it, it's in later times, it's in, as in post-beginning of the church, the church is going to start moving away. And so that's, again, why he keeps writing this stuff. Keep coming back to Jesus. Keep coming back to the gospel. As we talked about a few weeks ago, Paul, in one form or another, shares the gospel like four, four or five times in the first half of this letter. He's just, we've got to keep returning to this because sometime in the future, you know, this afternoon or next week or a month from now, you're going to be tempted to be led away. And so return back to this. I'm teaching you, he says to Paul, uh, to Timothy, I'm teaching you these things because I might, I'm planning on getting there, but I might not be able to get there. Um, and so I want you to know, keep coming back to Jesus, which sounds very Baptist pastory. Come to Jesus. Um, but that's really what that, that's it. Like, we got to keep coming back to him time and time and time again. Okay. Um, the next question is regarding uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, Let no one despise your youth. Instead, you should be an example to the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. So the, the question is, um, when it comes to our different identities, um, how do we go about keeping those rooted in Christ? Okay. Yeah, that's good. And just looking at the time, um, if you do, if you're in here or online, if you have a question, um, get it in right away or raise your hand and we'll, we'll come to you because I think we'll probably wrap up in a few minutes. But um, yeah, the identity thing is huge for us as people. Um, and I recognize it in myself all the time. I, I mean, throughout my lifetime, I've been identified as a number of different things. You know, I'm a son, brother, 
now husband, father, all that kind of stuff. But in school, I was always kind of identified as the nerdy, you know, the teacher's pet, that kind of stuff. And, and in all of these things, I've, again, my competitiveness, I always wanted to be the best. And so I had success here and success there. And it was probably, I mean, when I got to university, I was no longer interested in being the best. And so my grades somewhat reflected that, although I did okay. Uh, but getting married um, made me realize how hard it would be to be the best husband. Because getting married, I thought, hey, I'll just be me and that'll be great. And I found out uh, on day two, probably, I don't know, um, that, that being me is not a great husband. Um, being me is actually pretty selfish. And so if I rooted my identity in being you know, nerdy and getting good grades throughout high school, and I did that in university, if I still wanted that and failed at it, now I'd be crushed. When I came into marriage and, and wanted to, you know, I'm going to be the best husband around. And I quickly found, one, that I wasn't the best husband around, and two, um, I found myself comparing myself to others as the measuring stick. So, well, I'm better than that person over there. I'll try not to point at anybody. You know, I'm better than that person over there, and you should be thankful that I'm not like that person. But that, again, that's a false identity because the real identity is in Jesus. And so if I'm going to claim to, and if you don't claim to be a Christian, if you don't see Jesus as the Son of God, it's wide open. You, you're now making your own way of living. Uh, I would argue against that. I think it's terrible. I think history has shown us that true followers of Jesus are, are what fulfilled, meaningful living is all about. But if I'm going to call myself a follower of Jesus, I'm going to have to constantly humble myself, be humbled, and find my identity in Christ only. And so that means, in a marriage context, that means actually listening to my wife. And when she says, you're being an idiot or stupid or whatever I'm doing, instead of giving a defense of myself, I need to actually stop and listen and say, oh, I understand, I, I see where I'm failing. And this happened really powerfully to me uh, two or three years ago. Anne shared something with me and and for, for whatever reason, for the first time, God opened my eyes to this, this thing that I was doing that I didn't realize I was doing because I constantly denied it. And it was, I think it was in the, the realm of, you know, how I talked to her and, and those kind of things. Because I grew up in a sarcastic family and I always wanted to say, well, I'm just being sarcastic, whatever. And it, it took me, I don't know, 17 years to finally come to the terms and recognize, like, my sarcasm is not sarcasm to her. And so the identity piece was for me to say, if I really am going to be a Jesus-following husband, i got to let go of myself and my way of doing things and practice new ways. And so that's one particular example, but that example plays out in everything. Career ambitions, school ambitions, um, financial ambitions, what relational ambitions, like, it doesn't matter. And Paul's saying to Timothy, don't allow, again, the culture, age was a big thing. The older you are, the more respect you gained culturally. And that's somewhat the same as us, but not quite the same. Um, actually, nowhere near the same. Paul said to Timothy, look, you are a representative of Christ. You have had the gospel, you've lived it out, you've been prayed over by the elders, you've been trained in it through your mother and your grandmother. Don't let anybody distract you. Just because they're older than you and apparently culturally have more wisdom if it strays from the way of Jesus, don't let them step on you. You have been charged with this responsibility of leading the church. Lead it in the ways of Christ. And so, uh, back to my original example, I've been charged, because Angela and I made a commitment to be married, uh, I've been charged with the responsibility of being a husband to Angela and a father to our kids. And so, don't let my own selfish ambitions or other people's language distract me from living that out fully in Christ and what that looks like. Um, so we, it, it's a matter of constantly being reminded. So that Paul sends Timothy these, these rules. These rules are, are measuring sticks. You know, are you as an individual above reproach? If not, what do you need to do to work that out in your life? What do you need to repent of? Are you a lover of, whether it's money, alcohol, career, popularity? If you're a lover of those things, Jesus is not... God of your life. He's not king in your life. So what do you need to repent of to come back to him? And when we constantly go through that process, our identity is found solely in him. 
Um, and it, it, it's a working out process. Anyone who says, I made, a, I made a commitment to follow Jesus when I was 5, 10, 50, 80, and then says, you know, phew, made the decision, I'm good to go. No, work it out. Keep practicing the ways of Christ. Keep allowing him to work through your life uh, to conform your ways to him because that is where true life and health and all those kinds of things are found in the midst of any circumstance. If I can, I know we said we, we'd kind of wrap up, but I think you've touched on this next one for the most part. I just want to make sure. Um, there was a question regarding a phrase that's out there. The speed of light is now outdated. Mm. Everyone now moves at the speed of want. Right. Would you mind kind of commenting sure. and addressing that? So when I, when I got that, uh, I got that in an email, and at first I laughed because of who it was sent from, and I thought... I thought, oh, it's an, a joke. And then I read it and went, wow, this is, this is a really powerful phrase that we have to pay attention to. Speed of light is outdated. As we know, speed of light is the fastest thing we are aware of. Um, but we now move at the speed of want. And that is, again, everything that Paul's telling Timothy, everything that Jesus tried to teach the disciples, everything the work of the Spirit is about is to root out that want in our life. And it comes back to, I think, full circle to where we sort of began, is what is the thing that's driving what you're doing? Is it your own selfish desire? Um, and, I mean, selfish kind of makes it, puts it in a realm where we think, well, it's not a bad desire, so it's not selfish. But is it your own desire for whatever, or is it what Christ is calling you to? To live out what it really means to. And if we actually did that, we would have to, on the one hand, slow down, because it takes time to listen to Jesus. It takes time to meditate on his word. It takes time to gather as his people. It takes time to build relationships with one another. But we also have to speed up because we've got to move beyond um, our own interests and look to the interests of others. And so there's work to do in that because none of us by nature goes, hey, I'm going to lay down my life for my neighbor. By nature, all of us goes, I'm going to avoid that because that looks dangerous. Um, and so we have, to, we have to be driven. If we're going to, again, call ourselves Christians, we have to be driven by the ways of Jesus, uh, not by our own interests. And, so, and that's, that's just a constant, again, working out. Because I know when I get up in the morning, well, when my alarm goes off in the morning, the battle has begun. Because Tyler says, you got more time, go back to bed. Um, following... Christ says, you should have gone to bed earlier last night. Don't make that mistake again tonight. Get up and get going. Because I know my own interest uh, is, is rooted in what I want to do in any, any given moment. And we have to, as people, recognize it. And so we get, we get lost in saying things like, well, I'm a good person. No, you're not. I mean, you're good relative to society, but to the holiness of Jesus, we're not good. We're selfish. And so I don't say that negatively. I don't say that as a stomping on people. I, we just, it's so much easier to deal with struggles when we actually recognize them and go, hey, I got a lot of work to do. And this is the, the best part. I'm not on my own because I'm part of a community of people. And I'm not on my own because as Jesus said to his disciples, I will send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to come in and through you. And so we have to return to that, that whatever struggles we're facing, we're not alone because we're part of the body of Christ, and so expose those struggles to one another that we might share in it together, and we're not alone because Jesus sent the Spirit to work in and through us, and he's guiding us, and his grace is sufficient. Um, so no matter where we're at, his grace is sufficient. We can come back to that. So when you feel like, oh man, I'd like to wring my neighbor's neck or, you know, whatever the case may be, I don't want to do that. No, but really, God's grace by his Spirit, you can participate in what he's doing to make his glory known uh, through you and through us collectively as the church. Sounds good. All right. Well, that's, that's that. Um, I hope some of the discussion has been helpful. Um, by all means, if things have been confusing or you disagree or you need clarity, by all means, contact me. Because I really, I truly believe, as I read Scripture, Scripture is a communal thing. We read it on our own, we meditate on our own, we pray on our own, but we also come together as the people of God. And if we're not engaged in a dialogue about it, uh, we're missing a big aspect of what it means to be the church. So by all means, uh, I would love to have any sort of feedback and input. And um, as we work through the, the word of God together, 
to grow as his church, to proclaim his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so with that, I am going to invite us to stand for the benediction, because I think we, that is where we're at. Let me, let me check the notes so I don't forget things again, as I often do. Let's pray together. We're going to pray for the, pray for the offering, and then I'll give the benediction. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace that is sufficient. Spirit, continue to work in and through us, guiding us, leading us, challenging us, convicting us of where we've gone astray and inviting us back, showing us the way back to you through our confession and repentance. We pray, Lord, that as we give to you both of our time and energy, but also of our resources, we would let it go into your work here at the church. As a church, may we be responsible with the money and, and resources given. May we listen carefully and engage completely in the opportunities for ministry you've given us. Multiply the finances to meet the need. Multiply our hearts that we might be filled with you and that we would engage wholeheartedly in making disciples wherever we are. And so we ask your blessing upon the offering. We ask your blessing upon us as we go out from this place with you in our hearts, with your word before us, knowing that we are part of your body here at Crescent Heights. We praise you for your goodness to us. May we be disciples who make disciples both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. You are God's people. Go with his blessing upon you. Have a great afternoon.